this will last for the people are asking this is being recorded so for the people it's either too early or too late feel free to go back to bed i guess and um and this will be recorded yes and it will last one hour yeah. or more or less i don't know we have so many questions um, <laughs> 108 so if we can answer all of them in one hour <laughs> well anyways so the there's this link that is pinned in the live chat you can see it here so if you click on that link you will be rejected to slido and this is where you ask questions so i know that you have a lot of questions and we see already here 100 something 110 so you can all go there and ask your questions and in the meantime i will start with the slides that i just finished like a few minutes ago so i know that uh, a few more people should join ankush should join i don't know if uh, michael will join but anyways i think they can join as i as we go through the slides so welcome today is a very exciting day because we finally start our data engineering course. I know many of you wanted uh, this course to start. I see that by the activity in Slack, that's amazing. It's a bit overwhelming to be honest, but uh, it's always nice to see that what we do, uh, this kind of enthusiasm as a reaction to what we do. So thanks a lot for that. So today, what we will uh, cover in this particular um, video stream is this is the plan so we'll talk about the course team who is behind this course then the actual course then how exactly the course is organized then we will talk about the slack our slack where all the interaction happens and then we'll talk about how the companies that support us and how you can support us and we will go to the q a section um so too bad is uh, that ankush is not here uh, actually this is I, well, what I did is I copied the slides from the last year and changed them. And um, yeah, sorry, Ankush, I did not update your position because I know that you're not at Shopify. But actually, so Ankush, there is a story behind how the course started. So first, in uh, Data Talks Club community, we had a course about machine learning engineering. And Ankush was one of the students and he liked the course and then he approached me and Sejal, who is one of the past instructors. And he said, let's do a course about data engineering. And when we all thought that this is a good idea, um, then Victoria joined us and this is how the course started. And Ankush was one of the person actually who decided to, to share this idea to start that. So, um, so thanks Ankush, sorry about the mistake. You can all find his current position on his LinkedIn, because I, I don't remember the company where he works on at, but he's one of the instructors and he's covering streaming and Google Cloud Platform and Data Warehousing Mix. Then Victoria, uh, yeah, maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, yes, so I joined because I remember that you did like a uh, some kind of forum or something like that where people could vote or suggest the topics and then DT came out and I said I can I can help you out with what topics need to be covered and turned out that nobody else knew DVT. So that's how I ended up in the course, I guess. And then DVT hired me. Uh, but uh, probably like uh, Ankush could add it in, in his slide. Uh, maybe I should clarify that this is not part of my work uh, to be here today. Um, I am not a data engineer, but I've been in a variety of data related. So I've been an analytics engineer, I've been a BI engineer uh, for over the last nine to 10 years. And I'll be covering the the week, the module four uh, around analytics engineer. So we'll, I'll teach you DBT, uh, basics of data modeling and uh, to visualize that data at the end. Thank you, Victoria. So this is me. I am not a data engineer and I see a comment from Matt 
So Alexei and the rest are data scientists. Not, it is not correct. I am a data scientist. Uh, I never worked as a data engineer, but data scientist is such a versatile title. In my work as a data scientist, I did so. I have I had to create so many pipelines, which hopefully makes me qualify for the as a course instructor. So I'll be covering the first week with Docker, um, and uh, the week with batch processing with Spark. I worked a lot with Spark in the past, and I also happen to be an instructor for a few other two other courses that we run in Data Docs Club. So which is machine learning Zoom Camp and MLOps Zoom Camp. Uh, yep. And then Matt is not here. So Matt is a, he works, uh, he is actually a data engineer. He last his last position was a data engineer before he joined Mage as a developer relations. Uh, so as a DevRel person, he is taking care of uh, activities of educating around about Mage. And uh, that's why he's teaching the module about Mage, about workflow orchestration. He's also a book author. So with Matt, I hope he will get, of course, if you already started with module two, you must have seen Matt already. And I will try to organize a office hours with Matt so you can get to know him better. And then uh, Michael is not here. Michael is one of the past students, uh, like Luis, who is on the call. So he's working as a senior data analyst and he was, um, so first he was a student of the data engineering Zoom camp, then he was a teaching assistant and now you will enjoy his videos on Terraform. So he created, uh, recorded a few videos on Terraform. Uh, you will love them. I really like Michael's voice. It's so deep, I think he should work on uh, I don't know if he's watching that, but I, I told him that he should consider career making commercials, maybe later when he's tired of all the uh, data work. But yeah, so you will see him in Terraform videos and maybe in some other things, uh, in some other videos too. And now we have Luis. I was on mute, of course. Uh, so I'm uh, from Portugal. Uh, I'm working as a data engineer uh, in, the, um, in the company that's called Engineers Line that works for Publicis. Uh, and I will be supporting uh, some, uh, some uh, weeks, more specifically this first two weeks, and on the analytics, uh, since I work a lot with DBT also, and also saw me in some videos regarding the, the WL. WSL and uh, GitHub conference. I was also a graduate from 2022, and actually it was through that graduate that I that I got into one uh, one job. I think uh, it was really <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. And that's it. Yeah, and uh, the video you made about GitHub code spaces is amazing. It's uh... It's actually so simple to use yeah. it. I never realized. Yeah, so thanks for making the video. The, and, the, fantastic uh, is that, the fantastic is that already has Docker and Python, everything yeah. installed on it. So yeah, you don't need to go all through that problem of installing lots of things. <laughs> and then I have two last slides with past instructors. So Sejal was one of the first instructors. So, so you can see here with videos on uh, Terraform, the past videos, and Airflow. So in the first edition of the course, we had Airflow. Now we have Mage. So you will probably see here, if you go to the like old previous editions uh, content. And Irem, she was um, a teaching assistant in the last edition. She is also a graduate from the first cohort. And she recorded a few videos on streaming with Python. I think these videos are still there. So thanks, Irem and Sejal, for being with us. And right now, we will talk about the actual course. Mm. So I don't know if the, it makes sense first, prerequisites and syllabus, but I guess, yeah, this is how we did it in the last two years. So many of you ask if this course is for you. 
And I want to say that this is not the easiest course. So it requires some familiarity with programming. So you should already know at least one programming language. Ideally, it's Python. If it's not Python, if you know Java or JavaScript or Ruby or whatever, you can pick Python fairly easily. Like you'll need to invest some time, yes. But um, if you already know how to program, then Python for you won't be too difficult. Then we also expect that you know how to use command line. Um, so basic uh, bash commands like navigating, I don't know, changing directory, doing ls, um, this kind of stuff, and executing Docker commands. Um, and then before you close the tab with this window, because you think, okay, like I'm not comfortable with command line, many students aren't, and they still finish the course. So what you should do if you think that you don't have some of these prerequisites is take the week, the first module with Docker, and it's also one of the most difficult modules. And if you can go through this module in two weeks and finish it, then you're good to go, right? So that could be like your, how do you call it, lacmus test. Like you can assess your uh, level of how comfortable you are with command line. Right? And then exposure to SQL, it shouldn't be your first, the first time you see SQL. Uh, so you should know like things like select, group by, and so on. And of course, since this is an introductory course to data engineering, we don't expect any prior exposure to data engineering. And uh, this is the course repo. And uh, I will now post this link to, I think it's already open, I will post it to here to live chat, but it's also in the description, hopefully it should be, yeah, so this is the in the description, and we will go through this, uh, through this uh, repo right now, but before we go, I want to ask you to do us a small favor, if you all go, if you all press on this link, and give us a star it will help us to spread the word about the course because if you do all of you 1300 people all of you go there and press on the star we will go to github trending and if we go to github trending people who periodically che check github trending will see our course and for some of them it will be interesting so they will enroll in the course too so you will help us spread the word about the course so please Take a moment of your time and give us a star and I'll take a sip of water. And while you're giving us a star, I will check what we have next in the slides. Yeah, I asked about the star, so please do it. I'm wondering if I now refresh, will I see all the new stars? Just a comment, come on, like there is a thousand of you. Just give us a star. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and then there's a bit of delay. So you are probably now giving the stars and because there is delay between the, um, our conversation in Zoom and the stream on YouTube. Yeah, it'll take some time eventually. A lot of people, a lot of people are saying they, they gave a start already, so. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, that's <laughs> the main reason. <laughs> And and saying what Tina says, the only reason I'm not staring is it, like giving a start is because it's already uh, she already yeah. gave they already gave start in the past. So okay, I'll just go through this repo, and yeah. this is the, this repo is um, kind of the main entry point for you to the course. So this repo has all the information you need, and it starts with. Um, you probably, because all of you are here, you probably click on that button at some point. It's actually an image, it's not a button, you can see it here, because like I have this dark thing. Anyways, um, so what you need to do, like basically these first bullet points describe what you need to do. Um, so join our Slack, go to the course channel and join the Telegram channel. 
you have probably all done that already and I want to go through the syllabus right now and yeah I don't need to do it here I think I can just um, yeah do it in the slides so we have six modules and two workshops and I will just go through these uh, modules and um, workshops too so in the first module it will it's sort of like introduction model so we will talk very briefly about what data engineering is and most of the time we will spend setting up the environment and doing some things with this environment so we will set up a google cloud account and google cloud gives 300 dollars for everyone who signs up <clears throat> that's one of the reasons actually we chose google cloud and because it also has bigquery one of the tools we use then we will learn uh, docker and we will run postgres inside docker and we will build a simple data ingestion script in python with docker and then finally we'll learn terraform to manage code uh, to manage infrastructure in google cloud with terraform code so this this is the first module and it turned out that this is the most difficult module one of the most difficult ones at least and maybe airflow was even more complex but now we don't have airflow anymore um, so we have two weeks for this module for these reasons so you will have time to set up because setting up docker and google cloud account and all that requires time um, so you shouldn't rush so that's the first module then in the second module we will talk about Mage mostly. So we'll see how to use Mage to simplify the script we created in module one. And uh, Mage is such a nice tool. So you will see how to um, get the data we worked with in the first module and put it to uh, Google Cloud. And I think I did mention the data that we use. So actually the data set that we use throughout the course is the data set about taxi thieves in New York. So what it has, it has the, um, so in New York there are taxis, right? So every time you call a taxi and you want to go from location A to location B, this data is recorded. And we will work with this data uh, throughout the entire course. And uh, yeah, so in the first course when we learn about Docker and SQL, revise SQL. We'll use this data and then we'll do it with Mage. We'll take the data from this New York taxi data set and we'll put it to, uh, to Google Cloud Storage. And one more thing I wanted to mention about the data set is that when we first recorded this course, the data set there, the new New York um, taxi trip was in CSV and we did all the course about that so in the course we converted from C first from CSV to Parquet then we did a few extra steps and then we uploaded this Parquet to Google Cloud Storage and then when the course finished what this company uh, NYC TLC I think it's uh, taxi limousine commission whatever so what they did is they changed the CC file to Parquet files, right? So basically we sh were showing how to convert from CSV to Parquet and this step was no longer needed, right? Because the, the files were already in Parquet. So what we did is we kept the CC files and we uploaded them to GitHub. And in this course, we continue working with the CC files. So you kind of get to do a few steps. So you don't just copy a file from one place to another you get to do some transformation and that's why uh, you will find the link to this uh, data here at the beginning of the syllabus so this is the link and we will use the the data from here the csv files so this is how you find it and i now go back sorry for jumping a little bit to the first workshop so after the uh, week about workflow orchestration we will see another tool for loading data to a data warehouse and this is this will be dlt data load tool 
And Andre Adrian, who is a co-founder from DLT, he will show us how to do that. So it's not a course module, it's a workshop. So there is a slight difference. And the module is pre-recorded, all the videos are there. There is like six questions homework that you need to do. You don't have to do, but you can do. Workshop is like a lightweight module. So it happens live. Then you will have a homework, but it's smaller. So we'll have a workshop right after the <clears throat> uh, workflow orchestration module. And then we'll talk about, in module three, we'll talk about data warehousing. So here we'll talk about BigQuery. So of course it's not here. So yeah, maybe he would have said a few words about that. But after the BigQuery week, we'll have DBT week. And maybe Victoria, you can tell us more about that. Um, yes, so what we'll do in uh, week four is we'll take the data that was loaded from the previous weeks. And uh, probably it's worth saying that uh, the, like week four and then the other some of the other weeks as well, they have um, like hacks uh, for you to load the data in case that you're a little bit delayed and things like that. So always make sure that uh, if you see that you get delayed in one of the other weeks and things like that, you can always catch up. And um, and what we'll do is um, with DBT, uh, we'll transform that data. We'll take it from that source. We'll do some fact and name tables. Uh, so we'll apply dimensional modeling and um, we'll learn the basics uh, to work with DBT and then we'll expose it in, uh, it's actually Looker Data Studio now. And for days that, are, that uh, can't use cloud or GCP or for whatever reason, I know some countries have some limitations, um, then there's also an alternative always local. So um, I'll show in some, there's always like the A and the B. So the alternative B, you'll be using something like DBT core locally, and then we'll deploy metabase locally for the BI part, for the analysis part. That's it. Yeah, and then after that, we'll have module number five, which is about batch processing. And here we will use Spark. It's kind of similar to DBT in a way that uh, at the end they kind of solved the, the similar problem. Uh, but it's a different approach. So we'll discuss both DBT and Spark. So in uh, module number five, I will show how to use Spark. And Spark maybe like it gives you more control over how you do things. So sometimes you might prefer that over DBT, but you will see throughout the course uh, uh, how exactly you can approach things differently and how Spark is different from DBT. So we will talk about Spark and we will also show how to use Spark on Google Cloud. But of course, everything that we show can be done uh, locally too. And then after that, in module six, we will talk about streaming. So streaming is a very different approach to batch processing. So in batch processing, you have all the data that is there somewhere. You load all this data, you process it in one go, and you save the result somewhere. Streaming is different. In streaming, you process data as it comes in. So as a, a new data point arrives, a new event arrives, you immediately process it and store the results somewhere. So Ankush will talk about that. Ankush will talk about Kafka. And there in that week, so this week is special in a sense that it's different from the rest because here we use Java, but don't be afraid. So here, so Java just is used because it illustrates the internals of Kafka better than Python. But then there is also a video how to use Kafka with Python. And if you want to learn more about streams, uh, we will have another workshop, workshop number two, which will be about using SQL for processing stream data. So it will be at the same time as module six, and we will learn about the tool, also open source, um, called Rising Wave, where you can see how to do that. And then after six modules and two workshops, you will, it will be a lot of information that you will need somehow put everything you learned in practice. And for that purpose, we will have a project. So the project consists of two parts. The first part where you actually work on your project and then you submit your project. And then the second part would be 
will be the part where you evaluate three of your peers. So you will see the work of three of your peers, you will try to execute it, understand, learn from it. And at the end, uh, that's actually more or less it. Yeah, that's the course. And then talking about the course logistics. So now you know the content, now you know the prerequisites and who is uh, who are the instructors. Now we'll talk about how exactly we run it. So all the lessons, all the modules uh, are pre-recorded. And this is a very popular question, how do I find videos? So if you go to any module, let's take module one. And if you scroll down, you will see these links, right? So introduction to Docker, ingesting and why taxi data set to Postgres, connecting PG admin. So all these links are videos, right? And then you just click on that link and you watch the video. And then uh, since I'm already in week one, in module one, so there is an extra part, environment setup. You might want to watch it before you watch the rest or in parallel. So this environment setup shows you, tells you how to prepare the environment for the course. So the easiest option is using GitHub code spaces. There is a more complex and perhaps more flexible version is using a cloud virtual machine that you get from GCP. You connect to that machine and you set up the entire environment there. And then I think we need to update that. All the homework, so you can see homework here. So I don't think this is the right link. So all the homework, there's another slide about that, but since I'm talking about that already, I will show you how to find homework. So you go to the cohorts folder. We are now in 2024. And then you go to whatever module you want to find homework on. And then, for example, for the first module, this is where the homework is. And um, yeah, Luis prepared this homework. Thanks a lot, Luis. So this is the homework. So yeah, this is how you find the videos. All the lessons are pre-recorded. And as I mentioned, there are workshops that are not pre-recorded, but of course, videos like the, the, the stream we have today, everything stays on YouTube, so you can watch it at any point when it's convenient for you. And sometimes we'll have office hours. So office hours are live events where we ask answer your questions. So we will have one for sure before the project, because most of you will have questions about the project. And we will have one or two throughout the course. Um, and we used to have office hours every week. And in those office hours, we probably answered most of the questions. So yeah, you can just go and watch them. So there is no need for us to do it again. We will only have, uh, for sure, we'll have an office hours uh, session on Mage because previously we did not have Mage. So this time we'll have it on Mage and then before the project and uh, as we need, maybe we'll have one more. Uh, I already talked about the project, so you work on the project and then there is peer review process and this is how you find another way of finding videos. You can find them on our YouTube channel and I think it's better if I just show you how to do this. So you go to YouTube, to our channel. And so this is our channel. You go to playlists and then uh, so there are two playlists that you're interested in. This is the Data Engineering Zoom Camp 2024. It contains videos that are specific to this cohort. And then there is a video about Data Engineering Zoom Camp with all the course videos. So yeah, you're interested in these two playlists. But if you're interested in the Office Hours videos from the past editions, check this Data Engineering Zoom Camp 2022 and this one, 2023. Um, yeah, another thing, uh, at the end, you will get a certificate for passing the course. But homeworks are optional, right? So in order to get a certificate, you need to pass the project. If you pass the project, you will get a certificate and homework. So maybe you already know Spark, you don't want to do uh, a module about Spark or, you know, DBT, 
right? So if you know something, you, you feel free to skip these modules. And if you join late, it's also fine. Like you, if you just catch up with all the videos without doing homework. At the end, what we care about is that everything you learn about, you can put in practice and make a project out of it. And that's why the only criteria for passing the course is passing the project. But we want to still motivate you to do homeworks, right? So it's not like you just uh, don't do homeworks at all and do the projects. And that's why we have a leaderboard. So a leaderboard is, I'll show you. So this year it will look slightly different, but just for you to know what I'm talking about, there is a leaderboard with where you can see all, oops, What's happening? Hmm. So this is not the leaderboard I was looking for. I was looking for this public leaderboard, which is... Okay, at the end there will be a leaderboard like that, which is public. I was looking for a um, Google spreadsheet. Yeah, this one. So this is how the leaderboard will look like when it loads. Um, so you see, we have a lot of homeworks, uh, a lot of projects, and each line here is a student, and you see the scores for each of the homework and then the total. And the top 100 people from this leaderboard go here. And this is how we want to motivate you to also do homeworks. Okay. I'm kind of tired of talking. We should go to the Q&A section soon, so then others can also talk. Yeah, sorry, Victoria. Michael, Michael right? you can introduce yourself. Ah, right. Michael, you're here. Yeah, he's not freezed because it's 20 minus 20 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> yes, very I was, cold uh, here. Yeah, I was, I had to talk about this slide, so maybe you can do, Michael. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, update that in uh, time, but uh, yes, I am not, not a data because engineer. I <laughs> one hour before the session. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes more sense. I don't feel so bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I'm a CETA senior data analyst, um, really kind of a tinker. I was in the first cohort when the data engineering Zoom camp ran, uh, helped TA uh, last year, and it's. I really have a lot of fun doing it, so I'm back and, and really excited to, to see what this cohort has in, in store for us. And what I mentioned, you probably did not hear, and it's too bad that you have such a good voice that maybe you can consider a career in radio or whatever. And well, the students uh, will enjoy that in your videos, I'm sure. Uh, recently, I, I just started, uh, I also do content creation for Kestra now as well. Uh, and uh -huh. I do have a YouTube channel. So if you do like my voice or want to see me uh, fumble around a terminal and try to solve stuff. Uh, you can find that as well. Okay. You have to end it. You have to end it with an I, Michael, for you. <laughs> something like you have to get a catchphrase or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Where was I? Yeah, homework. And I just now saw questions about homework. So first of all, I, I already showed you how to find homework. So the, the homework files are in this cohort 2024. In each individual module, you will find a link to the homework. And this year, so if you have taken the course previously, Luis and Michael know, we used to use Google Forms for that. And on the backend side, for us, for me personally, it was such a big pain because it required so much manual work of cleaning the data, you know, all this data engineering stuff. 
that after two years of doing that, it was um, I was tired. So last month, yeah, in December, I started working on this awesome tool, which is called the Course Management Platform. And yeah, it looks very ugly because uh, uh, I am just a mere data scientist. I don't have a lot of uh, CSS skills, but this is how the forms for submitting homework will look like. So this is already the homework number one that Luis created. And yeah, so you see the homework here. Let me find it. Um, so I go to cohort folder. And this is the first homework that you will need to do this in next week. And you see questions, right? So there is question number one. And then the, there are different options. So you read the question, you follow the instructions, you do the homework. And then in order to submit, you go to this and uh, we'll share the link here at the bottom. Forms for submitting, you will find it here. And you just find, okay, like which tag has the following text. And then uh, yeah, you will need to select one of them and submit it here. Right? So as an alternative to Google, not alternative, a replacement for Google Forms, we'll use that. And this is how you submit your homework. You will submit when I deploy it, because today, actually, most of the day, and this is one of the reasons I created slides only one hour before the stream, I was struggling with Terraform to get this thing deployed, and you will feel this pain this week, I promise. <laughs> It's not yet deployed, uh, but I'll try to finish it as soon as possible when I resolve a few Terraform issues. Uh, so we will announce that in the Telegram channel. But yeah, um, I think it's like more or less self-explanatory like what to do here. And then, um, yeah, this is the homework. And there is this thing we call learning public. Well, we don't. It's not our invention, but we have this special section in the homework, which we call learning in public, where we motivate you to share everything you learned or everything you want to share about what you learned in public, which means social media or different blog posts or whatever. And this is how it might look like. So I'll make it full screen. So you say, okay, like I just finished module one of data engineering Zoom camp and I learned Docker or whatever. So this is like a, just a simple example of how it might look like. And there are many reasons of uh, like why you want to do that. Um, so you not only share the knowledge, things you learned, but you also create visibility. So other people see you. Other people know that you are becoming more proficient in this topic and it can lead to very positive consequences. And this is my favorite slide in this presentation, all the presentations and Michael is smiling. And I just want to give you a couple of minutes to read this. So I'll not read it for you, I'll let it, you read it. Okay, it looks weird, right? His boss, boss, what? Sorry. Who, who is that guy? <laughs> Look, there, something is wrong with this. Ah, okay. This is how it should look like. Okay, now read again.
Okay, hopefully you read as fast as I, or as slow as I, because I finished reading this, probably you did too. Um, so yeah, that's one of the reasons you might consider doing that. Again, it's optional, you don't have to do this, but in general, like you can find a lot of praise on the internet why you should learn in public. And this is one of the proofs that uh, it actually, it's a good idea to do that. And I wanted to show you how to, like in the form, in this application, I had a lot of fun implementing that. And so you, you can share up to seven links or whatever, like depends on the homework. And you just put the links here. So it can be like your LinkedIn post, your Twitter post, your blog post, and you can add up to seven links. And I had so much fun implementing this in JavaScript. So that you see like after it's seven, it's disabled. <laughs> I'm so proud of that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and then, yeah, you, you just finish. Uh, I think we talk about the FAQ document. Oh, no, not yet. This is also a very important thing because FAQ document has questions to, has answers to everything. So you see this FAQ document and you hear when you only join, when you see the repo for the first time, there's these frequently asked questions. So this is the same document. So this is a super com comprehensive list of frequently asked questions, which probably contains an answer to your question too. So if you have a question, do not rush to Slack to ask that question. You first check the FAQ. I showed you the link. And then in 90% of cases, 95 maybe percent of cases, you will find an answer here. If no, if you don't find an answer, then you can go and ask, ask your question in Slack. Um, and probably like in these 5% of cases, there's an issue that nobody so far has come across. Um, at least they did not document it in FAQ. And we want to encourage you to also keep populating, keep working on this document. So this is like, a, everyone can edit this document. Everyone can add information to this document. And that's why we have this FAQ contribution. So let's say it's you help somebody in Slack. Somebody had a problem. Somebody asked about that in Slack and you help them. What you can do is you can say help with, uh, um, I don't know, like I'll just copy this. Help it with, and then you put this in quotes, right? And then you will get an extra point for, for help. Okay. Moving on, what do we have next? Ah, it's Data Docs Club Slack. So now I'll stop sharing the screen for a second. Actually, like I, I think it's 40 minutes, 43 minutes, and I've just been talking alone without letting these three other wonderful people talk too. So I'll try to wrap up very quickly. I'm so tired. <laughs> so where's my... I usually, for demonstration purposes, I use Edge and then there is a fake account. I'm just waiting for Slack to load. And I want to first check that there is nothing embarrassing before I share. I think yeah, it's good. Um, okay, so this is how Slack looks like. And typically when you enter Slack for the first time, you only see announcements, events, general interest in content, shameless promotion, shameless social and welcome. You don't see uh, this channel. You don't see course data engineering channel. Now let me leave. And I will show you how you can join this channel. 
So here, it's very unintuitive. Like, why would you put it here in um, add channels? I don't know. But yeah, you click here, browse channels, and you do course data engineering. Right? And then you can drag the channel. So this is how you do this. And this is the Slack channel I was talking about. Yeah, so you see some questions, uh, answers. And then we have this uh, lovely bot. We have this Telegram channel. And every time we post something to the Telegram channel, it's reposted automatically here. So like if you don't use Telegram, if you don't want to install another app, then don't worry. Everything will be duplicated to Slack. So that's roughly it. Uh, so a few things to add here, mm, like check FAQ, use threads. And I think we, we have a comprehensive um, instruction of how to ask questions in our repo. Asking questions here. So go through this document, please. And I'll try to fast forward. Uh, yeah, so you have seen these uh, workshops and uh, there are a few companies that support us, that supported us in making this possible and I want to say thank, I want to thank them. So Mage is one of these companies, it's a really amazing company, I am also an advisor in that company uh, and they are kind, very kind to support us also make it, this course happen. In addition to Mage, we have two other sponsors, DLT Hub and Rising Wave. Maybe it's uh, not a su surprise uh, for you. You have seen earlier in the curriculum that we have uh, workshops. So these are amazing companies. Both of them are open source and both of them and Mage, three of them support us. And they make this course, um, they make it possible for this course to happen. If you work at a company and you want to support the community, you can talk to your manager, it's possible. But if you're in, as an individual want to support the community, I don't have like a, a thing for Data Talks Club specifically, but you can support me personally. If there's GitHub sponsors, then like you can, I don't know, send five euros or 10 euros. And a good thing actually that donations in Germany are tax-free. So if you, uh, let's say decide to donate five euros, then I can spend all five euros on, I don't know, buying a donor or whatever. No, I don't think I can buy a donor for five euros. Yeah, inflation. Anyways, uh, yeah. And th there is a very nice story. It's actually one of the students from the previous edition, 2023. She did the course, she graduated from the course and she found the job. And she was so happy about that because she found the job because of the course, she wanted to give back to the course. And at her new job, they had training budget. So every year they get, I don't know, a thousand euros or 2000 euros that they can spend on different educational activities, such as courses, conferences. So she, what she did is she reached out to me saying, hey, can you give me an invoice for this course? Because I want to spend my training budget to give back to the community. So if you like the course, this is something you can do too. So just contact me and I will organize like invoices and whatnot. But this is definitely an option. And yeah, I think this is the last thing. Yeah, so now we go and talk about questions. I don't know if some of you can stay longer. I can stay. Uh, because we have so many questions and I spent like 90 minutes, 50 minutes talking about the slides. So we'll go now to this section and we'll start. Um, I don't know, does somebody can answer that? How many people were successful to get certificate? Does anyone remember from the last year? Well, in the leaderboard, you can try to see. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's... Yeah, a few hundred, I think. One yeah, hundred. It was... yeah. 
So I think the first homework was uh, like a thousand people submitted the first homework, maybe it's slightly less than a thousand, but it was a significant amount of people. Um, but um, slightly over a hundred graduated then. I I think if we consider, I think we had something like 3,000 at the very beginning in the videos, not doing the homework mm -hmm. stuff. And then by the end of the certificates, we probably got 10% of the people that joined uh, that got certificates. So completed the whole course, which is not a lot, but it does take quite a lot of effort. So it's uh, still mm -hmm. surprising. Mm -hmm. And again, like you can take the course at your own pace. You don't have to, if it's challenging for you, but you're getting a lot from this course, you don't need to rush. You can follow your own pace. Yeah. Anything to add? I guess I'm. Uh, can we define the final project ourselves? If, if yes, can we partner up with a nonprofit to provide directly value with the final project on a real use case? Does anyone want to take it? Well, yes, of course you can. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah it's, it's actually such a good uh, thing to do, like partnering with a nonprofit to not only work on a project, but also help somebody. That's amazing. The, 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 the big idea behind the project is that you 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 get a great portfolio, a great project in your portfolio to show up. I I use it. I use it twice. Uh, the the that engineering uh, Zoom camp projects to show. I did this. Check from you know, the overview of the whole final project. Okay. I guess I'm closing it. Uh, that's a question to you, which I think. Do we need to set up a GCP or code space environment or both? It's an or. It's, uh, <laughs> you don't need to do all the setups. You use our code space or the GCP uh, virtual machine, or you can even work on your laptop only if it doesn't try. <laughs> But uh, you can do whatever you want. It's not the end, it's a war. Uh, one thing I would add is uh, that for the course, in addition to a virtual machine, the environment where you execute the thing, like all the stuff, you also need access to tools like BigQuery or Google Cloud Storage. Of course, you don't have to do that. You can do things locally. Um, but it's better if you do them in the cloud. So that for that, you need to have GCP and code space is, is more like the environment where you execute things. Like it's kind of continuation and extension of your laptop, right? Where like the thing to where you do commands on the terminal or whatever. But then there are like all these data warehousing solutions, etc. So they need a different environment to run. This was way worse than the first data engineer because their flow Docker computers was, yeah, was awful. <laughs> okay, I started learning Python, but uh, I will finish only the introductory level before our course starts. Is that okay? I think it's okay. Luis, Michael, what was the level of your Python before you started the course? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I just switched my microphone. Uh, I was actually uh, pretty advanced in Python when I started, uh, but I'm in my head, I'm going through uh, the Python that's going to be used in the course. And I think it's pretty intuitive. Uh, as long as you know what a variable is, uh, know how to Google, look up functions. Uh, I, I think the course will actually help you learn a lot quicker because you'll be applying it. So I think that's a great starting point. And what we use is like if statements, for loops, uh, functions, right? There's nothing fancy like imports, like super basic stuff. 
that existed in any programming language. You just need to map the concepts from a different programming language to Python. And probably the interlevel course covers all that. Um, the same data engineering techniques we learn here are useful for ML jobs involving LLMs. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like definitely for ML, you use data engineering for preparing data. Um, but here, like at the end, the project we make will be about making a dashboard, right? And then all the preparation work you need in order to arrive at that dash dashboard. Um, so it's, I would say focus is a bit more on analytical side than data science side, yet most of these things are applicable to uh, data science too, right? So if you're a data scientist and you want to become better at preparing data set or uh, your data, then of course this will be helpful. Mm. So it will be useful for ML jobs too. I have no idea about LM, so I cannot talk about that part. But for usual data science uh, work, yes. What's the difference between a data engineer and backend developer? Data engineering supports analytics, machine learning, while backend dev supports apps. So maybe somebody who has uh, data engineering experience can answer that. Wish, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I know it. Yeah. <laughs> but because I, well, I'm more. Yeah, yeah. Pitori is going to talk. Okay. Yeah. So a backend engineer will be building applications. So if you think about, uh, let's say you work for some company that has an app. That app is generating that data that then you will analyze, right? So the backend engineer will be generating the micro, will be developing the micro services that will generate the data. So in a way, they're the the um, the ones that are generating the data, but they're not doing anything with that, and they're definitely not preparing it for any analytical uh, use cases. Um, that tends to be closer to operational data. That tends to live in a different infrastructure as well. And then comes the data engineer. So once you do get want to get analytics out of that data, then you'll need someone to ingest that data and make it easy to consume for analytic, analytical purposes. And that usually involves a different kind of infrastructure. You may want to set up a data lake or a data warehouse. You need to set up those pipelines. That's what the data engineer will be doing. Um, so I think like the answer that they have in there is more or less the real answer for the question. Yeah, thank you. Are there any recommended certifications that you recommend for us students to take to build credibility? Mm. I I have a polemic. I have a, a not a very good uh, opinion of certificates. I don't necessarily believe they build. I my recommendation. This is very personal to me to what I've experienced in my career and being a hiring manager. Um, invest the time uh, in doing projects like this one, like the final project. You you will have all the knowledge to do very useful projects if you can actually pair with an ONG, like an NGO, like someone suggested, or do something interesting like that. That will bring you way more value by the time you go to those interviews than a certificate, in my opinion, if you were to decide where to invest that time. But maybe someone has a different question, has a different answer. I agree. Okay. No, I do agree also. I, I think certification, not certificate, you also need to understand that the different but certification, perhaps more important for the consultants and the beginning of the career, because uh, most of the consultant needs a lot of people with lots of certification, but it's not uh, High demand. Okay. So I think a good thing about certificates is when you prepare to take an exam to take that test, 
you learn something along the way. And yeah. this knowledge stays with you, right? And this is the useful part. So like, for example, what I, uh, when it comes to, uh, I don't know, AWS certificates, if you only prepare for the certificate, but then at the end not take it, it's also good because you learn something, right? Yeah. And then even though you don't have this piece of paper at the end, you learn like about IAM roles, whatever. Okay. I think we spent like 90, not 90, 50 minutes talking about that. Yeah. Can we use DuckDB instead of Postgres for week one? Yeah. Well, you kind of lose all the fun of fighting <laughs> Docker and, uh, you know, losing your <laughs> sleep over it. <laughs> Why would, would you want to be that efficient? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a great, uh, it's a great database, and um, we actually in the first workshop with DLT Hub, uh, Adrian will use uh, DuckDB. But uh, so for first module, the purpose is not only to set up Postgres, Postgres in which you can ingest some data, but also struggle and start hating Docker or start. Loving it, I don't know, depends. Uh, so it's kind of useful to still go through the content, not because you want to set up Postgres, but because you want to learn about Docker, Docker Compose, uh, all the things. So Postgres here is um, more like an example of how you can put different containers together. So I still suggest to go through that. Okay, we... Anyone wants to add anything? No. Also, Postgres is very useful to know. I know no data engineer that doesn't know what Postgres is. So if you don't know, I would highly recommend to try it out or like read about it, the technology because it will come up in conversations or questions or whatever. Yes. And if you haven't used relational database systems before, uh, you probably don't want to go right to DuckDB. You probably want... Uh, Postgres, SQL Server, uh, those traditional ones will give you a great taste of how those work and store the data. Yeah. Okay. How will AI impact data engineering field? Is there any point learning these skills <laughs> if AI will take over? <laughs> I was hoping I was this question already. <laughs> So, what do you think? Uh, AI can will not take over critical thinking. So you can automate a lot of things, but I I believe like it's going to it's going to make our, our works better because it's going to help us to automate a lot of things. But there's still a lot of room to do. Plus, when you it happens with ChatGPT, right? Like I go and ask questions in purpose around DBT, for example, which I have to answer a lot of the times, and most of those answers are wrong and i know that because i know the concept right so i think it's still important to understand the concepts to be able to use ai correctly yeah yeah I, i'm also using some ai tools for um to write the descriptions of the the table and the, and the columns on dbt but uh, i have to be always on top of that because impossible to have all that and uh, well and we also need to have all the business requirements exactly <laughs> correct to ai to <laughs> replace us so yeah don't worry <laughs> also it's super helpful like as a kind of not partner but like uh, somebody who can take you just give it, you give ChatGPT a description and then it comes up with some code. And yeah. then even though this code might not be 100% correct, you correct this code and then you move faster at the end. And this website that I showed, this one, ChatGPT was super helpful here. And I, uh, at the beginning, I just started, hey, look, ChatGPT, I want to create this Django project with these requirements. And it would just tell me what to do. 
And then as the project grew, as it became more and more complex, I think ChatGPT became less and less helpful, but still quite often I could uh, copy paste some code and say, okay, now I want to refactor it. Or sometimes, uh, like for example, I didn't know how to run tests with Django. I just ask, hey, I want to test this thing. What do I do and what kind of test cases you recommend? And then it was, yeah, yeah. it was very helpful. But without me being there and trying to communicate with ChatGPT and make sense of what it says and also seeing where it's wrong, like it wouldn't work, right? So it just made me more efficient. Okay, what does, and if somebody of you needs to go, yeah, it's fine. I, I think I would spend like, I don't know, extra 15 minutes uh, answering these questions, but uh, yeah, we don't all have to stay here, like up to you. So what does the job outlook currently look like for data engineering, considering the widespread tech layoffs? How do you think it will look in the near future? Does anyone have an opinion about that? Uh, this might be kind of rambling, but I, I think the recent tech layoffs were a lot to do with uh, not projecting the economy well. You know, they overhired and then had to cut back. Uh, but just data engineering, we keep using that and it's it's kind of a box, but uh, there's so many skills that I think are included in that. And just staying curious and back to the last question with AI, we now have analytics engineer who knows what new titles and roles are going to be coming out in the next five, 10 years. But if you stay curious and kind of know what tools are out there, know how systems interact, I think you can adapt and there's always going to be positions out there. Especially when it comes to data engineering, because without data engineering, analytics does not exist. Machine learning does not exist. What else? Like many things cannot happen without uh, data engineers. And so it's kind of very important. Like if a company wants to do data, they need data engineers. How close is data engineering with MarTech and product analytics like CDP segment amplitude? even building on CDP using Snowplow, for example, for an example. CDP is customer data platform, right? Victoria, you probably know the answer, right? Um, yeah, I was changing data capture, I would say. I, I saw it, but no, it is true. It must be customer data platform, especially because segment and Ample2 are customer data platforms. I, I, I it's, it's in a way a part of the engineer, like as a data engineer, you'll be working with the sources very likely, like you won't be using Amplitude itself, but you will have to uh, connect segment, um, connect, like take that, right? Build a pipeline with, to ingest that segment data and uh, be able to, as I said before, make it uh, easy to consume to do the analytics parts. Um, and you'll be serving most likely the Amplitude uh, pipelines as well. And MarTech is this marketing, uh, okay. I guess. Yeah, um, the same. Like at the end, uh, there are a lot of different ways to generate and capture data from your backend and front end. Like Simon will take it from your front end events and you'll need to connect those. So as a data engineer, there's a lot to, to be done in there. Yeah, thank you. For somebody who's already a data engineer but haven't worked on these technologies, can we complete the Zoom Camp at our own pace? Yeah, I think we already said that you can take, yeah. you can already watch like previous videos to like Airflow, Perfect videos, old videos on Terraform. Uh, what else did we have? So yeah, feel free to like all the old content is there, the new content is there. You don't need to follow the the cohort. Work it, uh, work on it at your own pace. Okay, I guess I go to the next one. Uh, what is the motivation behind creating this bootcamp, and why is it free? 
it's fun, right? Creating good comics. <laughs> Victoria, why would, did you decide to join us? Um, I like doing things for the community in general. I like doing volunteering and stuff. Uh, so that was my motivation. But I do have to say, I only have a module out of the whole course. So <laughs> there's only partial uh, response in there. Well, it's, it's really fun. Yeah. And I, it is true that some of the, sometimes it's like overwhelming, but out of the mm. thousands of people to get to see those few hundred, even though if it's like 5%, 10% at the end, it, it's really, it feels really powerful to get to see that you help someone and then they'll get to help other people and, and such. So it's nice to be able to do that. And for me also, I learned a lot from three free sources. Yeah. And I wanted to kind of give back to, uh, I finished uh, when it comes to machine learning. So uh, as a data scientist, I needed to learn about machine learning. And I took one free course about uh, machine learning. And it was an amazing course. And I wanted to do something similar. That's why we had our machine learning engineering course. And data engineering course happened because of like this conversation with Ankus and Sejal uh, that I talked about. So, yeah. And the reason it's free is because we wanted to share knowledge for free. There are many paid courses, but not so many free ones. And then at the end, over a couple of years uh, time after doing this, um, so now I run this community full time. So this is my only job. And at the end, you saw the sponsors, right? So it's actually enough to, uh, for me to go, to go buy some food. It's less money than I previously had, but it's still possible to earn and to, how do you say, keep my pants on me? Anyways, I don't remember the idiom, but like I don't have to beg for food on the streets. So, Just yeah. can not point the camera. <laughs> <laughs> that I have pants, actually. Well, I have shorts. <laughs> Uh, yeah, at the beginning it was fun, but then like it took more and more time and then, yeah, uh, I needed to figure out a way to kind of earn money or start doing something else. Luckily it worked out. Um, so after successfully completing this course, are there more advanced data engineering courses you could recommend? Does anyone have, have recommendations? Try to get a job as a data engineer. Mm -hmm. But probably a specific, right? Like I don't, nothing comes to mind, but I would imagine definitely narrowing down in something more specific, like a streaming, for example. And there are a lot of courses around that, that concept and uh, that topic. Um, so definitely narrow down. It's like, if you think about the T-shaped um, knowledge concept, I would say this will give you like, the part of the T, so try to find what is where is that you want to focus and find courses around that part. Michael, did you take any courses after data engineering Zoom camp? Oh, I'm I'm always taking courses. Uh, and I'm kind of good staying where I'm at, but like Victoria said, and I've seen that posted elsewhere, uh, people saying batch and streaming should be kind of two distinct roles. Uh, so maybe after that decision, also, uh, what platform do you want to specialize in? Do you want to know Azure? Do you want to know GCP? Do you want to know AWS? Uh, I think the course gives a great foundation. So there's not really a whole lot to build upon there. It's more specialization. And Luis, for you, do you remember? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, one thing that people should should keep in mind is that data engineering, it's a very broad area. Uh, you shouldn't be expert in everything. You shouldn't be expert in analytics. You should be expert in everything. You should try to find your your passion on the data engineering, like streaming or like uh, working with clusters or something more 
or that you like, like I'm working as an analytics engineer uh, and, and focus on the on that uh, for your education. Uh, so don't try to be an expert on everything. Uh, that will not work at all. Thank you. So I think I should have mentioned that today, yes, indeed, we are going to start working on module one. Maybe we should have a separate Telegram announcement on that. But yeah, today is the day you start actually watching all these videos, preparing the environment, if you haven't done it so far. Well, uh, yeah, it's just one event. Today we will probably, uh, when we have more events planned, we'll add. I think at least I should add the, the workshops. Yeah, I'll add them. You will see more events and then when we have new uh, office hours, you will see them there too. Um, do you have any suggestions for any similar Zoom camp for someone who wants to be a data architect? Does anyone know a course on data architectures? Um, I can't think any good one, but I would uh, highly recommend to find anything around Kimball if you want to be a data architect. Uh, and there are plenty of books that we have around data modeling that um, you can find in the, I you mentioned this, right? I'd like to say before, uh, there's this in the Slack channel, there are this uh, resources that are pinned. Uh, and there's one that's also in engineering or something like that. And there um, I collected some of the data engineering, uh, data I mentioned that. So this awesome that data engineering, I did not talk about that. And this is, thanks for bringing this up. Because a lot of people ask about books in general as well. So I would highly recommend to get, to go through this even after the course. It doesn't, I don't think it necessarily has to be during the course, but this is uh, great resources. So this, oh, okay, who's doing that? <laughs> Um, where is it analytics engineering data mesh i think i missed it do you remember which section is it i uh, it should be uh, so i remember that i added kimball i added emon um i don't remember if we put the um, well i actually have them all here <laughs> Um, at Asia Data Warehouse, I can I can have a look in and yeah. ask. let's let's put it here. Yeah. And then I'll uh, go through the document and see what's happening. Because <laughs> last time I opened it was probably uh, last year. Yeah, me January. too. <laughs> we definitely had them. Uh, I I remember I added them, uh, but I should rem remember where. Uh, yeah. Interview questions? No, we don't have any interview questions. Um, coming up with project ideas. Yeah, when it's closer to the... Um, so at least we have um, a list with data sets that you can use. It's in the project data sets. Um, so check it out. And if you struggle to come up with ideas, we can just talk in Slack. And maybe I just answer the last question. Oh, I first answer that one. Would you consider using Airflow for the next cohort? Mm. <laughs> well, we already have a video on Airflow, so go check it out. Uh, probably over these two years, Airflow became simpler, but yeah, still the videos are out there. Check it out if you want to learn about Airflow. And the last one, why don't we use Discord for the community where we could provide points for people who help each other? It's kind of historically happened that we use Slack, so I don't think there is... Um, Mm, like we should switch now to a different platform. Okay, maybe we'll catch up with questions later. Not sure about all 302 of them, but um, maybe I'll just relax a little bit. Let my throat uh, get some rest. And then record another video offline where I answer on some of these questions and then I'll share it in Telegram. There are a lot of the questions uh, that were already answered in this video. So probably worth uh, to say 
rewatch this video. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of questions that are around dates and the repository and all of that. So most of these questions I would estimate that a good chunk of these questions would actually be answered either by rewatching the video or joining the Slack. So the most important thing is joining the Slack and going to the the questions uh, document that you mentioned. Yeah, thank you. And check the FAQ document. Yeah. Ah, by the way, I uh, say perhaps you can also mention the bot. The QA bot. Right, right. Thank it's you. Very important because they don't have to mention you. They can mention the bot. <laughs> yeah. So let me. This is really awesome. So what Alex, Alex is one of the students. So he already did MLOps Zoom Camp, ML Zoom Camp, and now he's taking Data Engineering Zoom Camp. And for every course he is taking, he brings his bot with him to the course. And right now, so for data engineering, what is this? Okay, I think I just need to refresh it. So I'll just say, uh, hey, how do I install Pandas FAQ? What's the name? Q. It's QA bot, something Zoom Camp QA bot. Zoom Camp. It's over oh, there. Ah, it's over there. So now the bot will answer. First, you will say that it's just a bot. Okay. Oh. <laughs> then it's a, yeah, see, so do people install so pandas? Uh, so I don't think this actually comes from the FAQ. So what it does, it looks at FAQ, it looks at the GitHub repo, and it also looks at the Slack history. And based on that, it answers the questions. And sometimes it can just answer a question because like there's GPT behind it. So GPT knows how to install Pandas. And that's, I think, where the answer comes from uh, right now. But it could be that it comes from one of the previous threads, right? So this is a super convenient thing. And thanks, Luis, for bringing this up because Alex is amazing. And Alex will have a webinar soon where he will talk about all the internals behind the bot. So, yeah. Is there anything else I forgot to mention? We didn't mention. No. Yeah, well. Then I guess we should be wrapping up. Thanks everyone for joining us today, for answering questions, for asking questions, and uh, yeah, have fun doing the course. Enjoy learning. Bye. Thanks everybody.